We'll just wait for a minute or two longer. Uh, those attendees are coming in. Uh, good good uh, notes in the chat box there. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I put my sparkly top specially on uh, for today. Good morning, everybody. Maybe you'd like to say in the chat box where you're where you are this morning and whether the sun is shining with you. Oh, we're at 99. Let's see if we can get to 100 before we start. Please to see it's sunny in Scotland. Oh, it's looking pretty good around, around the country, actually. Make the most of it. I think the rain's coming in later. OK, I think we're still stuck at 99, but I think we'll make a start. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final Landscape Institute webinar of 2020. I'm Jane Finlay, President of the Landscape Institute, and we have a packed programme for you this morning with lots of guests, and I'll be reviewing the most extraordinary 12 months we've all experienced. It's important that we take stock and, more importantly, look forward to 2021. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and our overriding theme of this morning's webinar is designing in a post-pandemic world. I'm delighted to welcome special guests, Dan Pearson and Louise Wyman, and I'll be asking them for their thoughts on design for a post-pandemic future. Over the past couple of months, the LI has been holding the Transforming the Urban Landscape competition, and I'll be talking to two of the judges about the entries, interviewing the competition sponsors before announcing the competition winners. Please use the chat box and the question boxes. It's great to have your interaction. And if we have time, I'll pass on your comments and questions to our guests. But let's just pause for a moment and reflect on this most extraordinary year. So I'll have a go at trying to share my screen. Right, perhaps somebody, Andrew, uh, Andrew, can you see that? Could you let me know if you can see that, please? Great. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. Thank you, thank you. So 2020 has been the most extraordinary year I've ever lived through, and I'm sure you must feel, uh, feel the same way uh, too. We've experienced more than our fair share of major events, and at the start of the year, we had absolutely no idea what was to unfold. Who would have thought that in January, when I was invited to speak at a number of events across the UK, what was in store for us? Uh, in January, I was invited to launch uh, to the launch of the West Midlands Combined Authority Design Charter, where climate crisis was the headline concern. And on the other side of the planet, in January, there were an uh, unprecedented bushfires in Australia caused by extreme temperatures and drought and we all remember those heartbreaking images of wildlife caught up in the disaster and in contrast at the start of 2020 we saw the most awful floods across the UK when three named winter storms crossed the country during February the heavy rainfall throughout the month caused many areas to flood and thousands of people were affected and some places along the River, River Severn were flooded three times in four weeks. This has been the wettest February record for the UK and the fifth wettest winter. And in February, reports of a new coronavirus in China were becoming headline news. It was so far away, we all thought it was just another disease like bird flu or SARS and unlikely to reach Europe. But by the end of the month, it was quite obvious we were all going to be seriously affected by this. It was centred on the Chinese city of Wuhan, a place where we hadn't heard of before then, and the disease rapidly spread, resulting in the total lockdown of the city's population. 
The virus quickly spread to the West and in early March, cases rapidly grew in Italy and Spain, suffering the highest numbers of infections and death in Europe at that time. The last in-person event I attended was for the LI. For the LI was in early March when I chaired the Fowler Symposium in Merle. On the way to the university, I walked past the Royal Berkshire Hospital, remember reflecting on the fact that one of the first cases of coronavirus in the UK was in that hospital. I and mean, it was a great day showcasing uh, interesting and reviewing the landscape of state-owned industries and large infrastructure projects that influence the shape of our landscape and our profession. And I think it was probably the last time I was on a train when I returned back to the Midlands from the event. Finally, in the UK, as number of cases rose and hospital beds were quickly filling, what had seemed to be many thousands of miles away became our problem too. And on the 23rd of March, Boris announced the first full lockdown in the UK. And we could see it coming, couldn't we? The week before Boris's announcement at FIRA, my practice, we decided to close our office. We moved all our staff and their tech to work at home with their kids and partners. As we all scrambled for space on the kitchen table and bandwidth on our Wi-Fi. And so began the communications revolution on Zoom and Teams and we've uh, adapted to working from home. It's changed the way we work, the way we play, educate and live. And I had never spent so much time in my own house before. The LI team at that time also started to work from home and quickly mobilized to create guidance and practical resources for members. The information is still evolving and regularly updated to reflect the government's current recommendations and best practice from our sector. And the LI team also started a new weekly programme of webinars to stay connected with the membership with the lunchtime learning series. And in April, we started regular leadership webinars. The first one was a complete disaster. The speakers couldn't get online, but we rebroadcast the event two weeks later. And since then, things have run fairly smoothly, touch wood. April also saw the launch of LI Campus, the online library uh, of all our recent CPD events. It's a fantastic resource like Catch Up TV, allowing learning from your home at your convenience. And you may remember that May warmed up nicely. In fact, it was the warmest spring on record and it encouraged people to get outside and crowds of people in towns and cities flocked to their local parks, to the coast and to our national parks. The scenes like these were unprecedented, causing a lot of damage by the high number of visitors. But it was also the month when people discovered the healing qualities of being in green spaces and close to nature. People watched and experienced spring in full bloom and we rediscovered our gardens and local parks. People even reported hearing birdsong for the first time. They had taken time to get outside. I, like many of us, spent time in my garden, my allotment, and I walked regularly in my local park. But one of the biggest benefits of lockdown was the dramatic drop in pollution in all our major cities. Some areas of the world saw even a 60% decrease in pollution and COVID-19 had achieved what years of political discussion and agreements on climate change had failed to do. In May, the LI published its Climate and Biodiversity Action Plan following our declaration of a climate emergency in July the previous year. The plan addresses the needs of the profession and the LI as an organisation and regulator, and it sets out a roadmap of priorities for the next three to five years, and there'll be more to come in 2021. In June, there was almost daily publication of research on how the lockdown was encouraging people to get outside and enjoying the benefits of contact with nature. And the debate was raging about mask wearing or not. And of course, now you don't have to, you can't leave home without one. June also start, saw the start of a worldwide Black Lives Matter campaign following the death of George Floyd. The pandemic is revealing entrenched inequalities in everything from healthcare to economic opportunity and even access to green, green space. And in June, the board and the LI team made a commitment to action in our future strategy and work plan. We want the landscape profession to be as vibrant and as diverse as the community it serves. This summer also saw the introduction of our new trailblazer apprenticeships, a way to earn and learn 
offering a great new route to qualification will help to attract more diversity into the profession. At the end of June, Adam White handed over the presidential reins to me during a webinar. Taking up office in the middle of a pandemic was not quite what I had in mind when I stood for election, nor was TV presenting, but there we go. July was a hectic month full of lockdown, as full lockdown had ended and we'd all had limited return to our offices and society started opening up again. My first formal LI meeting was chairing advisory council and the Grow Happy Sunflower competition was in full swing. Also in July, we held Bringing Health into the City CPD, a subject I have more than a keen interest in. We had two excellent keynote speakers, including Christopher Pincher MP, the Government Minister for Housing, and Carolyn Steele, the architect and author of The Hungry City. It was all going really well until my husband walked in on me with a cup of tea. Oops, gone too far. He walked in on me with a cup of tea just as we went live and several hundred people heard me shout to him, get out. I've never lived that one down. During the summer, LI members applied for and were approved as specialist consultants on the High Streets Task Force, a government project to support regeneration and revitalization, revitalization of high streets in England, which was perfect timing as the decline of our high streets has been ongoing for many years, but now the decline has accelerated due to the pandemic. And my own town of Sutton Coalfields is typical, a declining 1970s shopping centre and once it lost its anchor tenants, it's dying a slow and painful death. But I think this is a great opportunity for our profession to influence the high streets of the future. In August, the government launched its Eat Out to Help Out scheme and my own all allotment wasn't looking too shabby either. And this month I tackled one of my manifesto promises to engage with practices I was really keen to hear what businesses and public sector practices were experiencing. So we held four breakfast events to engage with practice heads during August. And these are just some of the themes we discussed. By September, we'd all settled into a new normal and our focus at the LI was returning to the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis with a fantastic CPD event. The week we held the event, the news was full of climate relation, related issues. There was the horrific wildfires fire, along the US Pacific coast. There was uh, fires in central Brazil in their largest wetland. There were bizarre bumps appearing in the Siberian landscape as the perma, permafrost defrosted, coupled with wildfires fire, releasing records amounts of greenhouse gases. And, in the same week, the Environment Agency announced that all the rivers, lakes and streams in England are polluted. It was quite uh, a sobering moment. In September, the LI published the Greener Recovery Paper with its five key asks of the government to deliver a sustainable recovery by leading with the green. It's a great piece of work. It highlights the relevance of our profession and the significant contribution we can make we now have an opportunity to build on this next year. It's been a beautiful autumn. I have been making the most of it in a socially distanced way, of course, with lots of walks with friends across Midlands uh, beauty spots. And of course, October is the time for our annual Jellicoe lecture. This year's lecture explored the themes of equity, diversity, and inclusion in landscape practice. The events of 2020 have highlighted how profoundly unconscious bias and structural discrimination still affect mi millions of people in the UK. October was a very busy month. We launched the LI competition, which we're going to hear the winners from today, transforming the urban landscape. And the start of November saw lockdown too, almost back to where we started in March as cases surged again. But this time the weather has become grey and really quite miserable. And of course, November, the news was dominated by the US presidential election. And this morning it's looking as though Joe Biden will take up office in January. And he has listed tackling the climate change amongst his top priorities and said the US will rejoin the Paris Agreement. So let's see what happens there. 
Also in November, I had the pleasure of chairing the session uh, on the for the Academy of Urbanism, celebrating the centenary of Ian McCarg. His work is relevant today as it was then. It was a super event and it drew together his connection with Scotland as the, and the USA with speakers from both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, November is the time for the annual LI Awards. It's the highlight of the year held virtually for the first time. I think it was a real success and thank you to the LI team. And if you attended, please let me know what you thought of them. The 2020 winners highlighted the landscape's power to transform the world for the better, retrofitting green space, imagining, reimagining public realm, revitalizing our high streets, building resilience and sustainable, sustainability into our cities and spaces. And I announced my choice for the 2020 LI President's Award, which was Cater Park in Kidbrook Village. After the year we've experienced, this project seemed to have it all, a green space in the heart of a city that offers an, an inspiring example of new nature inclusive approaches to public realm design whilst mitigating effects of climate change. It's a beautiful project and congratulations to HTA on that one. And finally, as the weather's deteriorated, although it really is quite nice today, and the shorter days are here for several months now, I've made a determined effort to get out outdoors, whatever the weather, and on Twitter I'm doing 30 days of 25 minutes, and this is uh, Louise Wyman's fault, she, uh, she got me involved, handing the baton over to me. I know it's difficult to get out during the working day, but I would encourage you to do it because you will feel so much better if you do. But we can now see light at the end of the tunnel. And whilst I don't think we'll ever return to the old normal, I am looking forward to 2021 when we'll be able to meet again, hopefully in person. So that was a quick canter through the year and moving on to our guests this morning, I will just stop sharing my screen. Uh, stop share, there we go. Great. And so moving on to our first guest this morning. First, I have the pleasure of introducing Louise Wyman. Louise took up the role as Strategic Director of Growth and Development at Manchester City Council in June this year. Previously, Louise led the Design and Inclusive Growth Agenda at West Midlands Combined Authority and was the Director of Strategy and Engagement at Homes England. Louise has led urban renewal projects in the USA and Central Europe and was a member of the planning committee for the London Legacy Development Corporation with responsibility for London's 2012 Olympic Park. Good morning, Louise. How are you? Good morning, Jane. I am really well, thank you. It's so good to see you on the screen, if not in person. Just looking at your slides, that, that event in January we were at together and it it feels like years ago now, doesn't it? But it's very good to see you in our in our community here. It, it certainly does seem like years ago. So um, it's been a busy year for you moving uh, to your new job in Manchester. How are you settling into your new role? You know, I'm really enjoying it. It's a very challenging year. I know other people will have started jobs in this year. Uh, and it, it's a, a massive challenge. I've got a big team, actually. I've got just under 700 staff. So it's a lot of people to get wow. to know remotely. Um, we are managing to spend a bit of time in the town hall where, where I'm based in our town hall extension. So I'll be heading up there actually after this, this session this morning. But the thing that has blown me away is the enormous support you get across GM, actually across, across Greater Manchester, from the political leaders to, to the business leaders to the environmental movement, which is, which is very strong. I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that. We have big ambitions for zero carbon sooner than others. Manchester's an ambitious place. So actually working with, with that community of motivated, of um, energised people uh, and this pandemic has, has thrown everything at us so so there's a lots of learning in, in my first, it's only, what is it, six months in post but but uh, it's a bit of a massive learning curve I'll be honest. I bet it has. Um, so uh, what have, our theme this morning is designing in the post-Covid world, what have you learnt uh, from the current uh, pandemic and how has it affected Manchester? Well, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, I began in um, June of this year, started the role in June of this year, but I knew I was going into post in March. And obviously everything was kind of hitting in terms of you, your timeline that you just set out. 
uh, in the spring. Uh, and Manchester, I think, has done what Manchester does best, kind of fa faced into the situation. Uh, very quickly, we collaborated very quickly with our core cities. So, so we, uh, the core cities group are headquartered in, in Manchester, but we, we looked at what other cities were doing. We worked very quickly with the OECD as well to look at what other European cities and world cities were facing. And then we knew that we needed to get a, a resilient plan together. You know, it is a city that I would say adapts, you know, particularly in the face of adversity. If you look at the history of Manchester, that you know, the recent history, the, the 96 bomb in the city centre actually then led to a massive phase of regeneration for Manchester. More recently, the arena bomb has, has led to far greater uh, kind of focus on, on our city centre, uh, the spaces that cr we create, how we create a healthy and safe landscape, particularly in a, in a, a safe kind of urban context. So, so we very quickly got our act together, I would say, working with partners. Uh, and we just uh, two weeks ago, at the same moment that the Chancellor made his spending review announcements, we launched our economic recovery plan. Uh, and what will be of interest to, to this group of people, I hope, is that we've put green growth uh, and a green industrial revolution and nature in the city, all those good things at the core of how we want to build back in a, in a better way, in a more inclusive way, and certainly in an innovative way. Uh, and then we've done lots of stuff locally. So there's kind of big scale plans. And then there's lots of stuff we've done locally to adapt the city very quickly. So we've pedestrianized 20 streets at, at pace. Stuff we would have done anyway, which would have taken 20, <laughs> sorry, it would have taken a couple of years to do, <laughs> hopefully not 20. Um, we did, you know, in a matter of weeks rather than, than years. We created those parklets that you've seen in other cities. We created outdoor cafes so people could enjoy the, the warmer weather. Um, we've now kind of adapted those to be winter gardens, winter parks. So, so actually I'm really proud of the, the talent of landscape architects, uh, planners, environmentalists in helping us reimagine Manchester. And that starts to create the foundations for, for how we'll come back and, and hopefully create a very kind of special phase of, of growth um, as we go into next year. I think uh, uh, Manchester is a, a good example of sort of uh, leading the way. You're, you're, set, you're setting a fantastic example for other, other cities, but there is a, a natural capital deficit in Manchester. And, uh, and definitely a lack of green space in the city. Uh, so uh, what sort of innovation, what sort of innovation are you seeing to, to address this? And um, how is it funded and maintained? You're absolutely right. It was one of the things that attracted me to Manchester, I'll be honest, because I saw it's, it's got a fantastic commercial property market. It's the biggest, uh, fast, one of the fastest growing cities in Europe. It's now the biggest uh, place outside of London to grow a digital business. So that kind of um, uh, potential of Manchester feels huge, but actually when you walk around, it's still a very urban, kind of lot hard landscape, uh, not so many big parks. Um, so, and again, that was known before I arrived, but that's one of the things I think I can bring. I'm the first landscape architect to be a strategic director for growth and development. So it, it matters to me that the landscape profession shapes, shapes Manchester for its next phase of growth. And we have some big projects that will help us do that. One that's got a lot of publicity is Mayfield, which is the first park for hundred years, first large city scale park uh, in Manchester, which is being developed um, in partnership with the city and, and you and I and other partners uh, right next to Piccadilly station. So that will, uh, unveil a new river, uh, sorry, not a new river, it'll create a new river space, um, unveiling the existing Medlock River, uh, far more focused on ecology uh, around um, the, the use of natural planting, native, native, native species, uh, a lot of tree planting, we're planting 20 million trees across the city, and then a next uh, phase of, of kind of greening of Manchester is towards the north of the city, that, that's our our area for a large scale regeneration. We've got investment going into the Northern Gateway and there we're creating a city river park, um, which will stretch all the way from the north of the city uh, down in, into the center of the city. So creating ecological corridors. I'm reading a lot about ecological urbanism uh, and really what that means and, and how we do that in a city that's quite, quite kind of, um, still has that post-industrial feel and, and the new waves of development. In terms of funding, that's where the challenge is come in but but I think the strength of Manchester is those partners and and we have a model where we work in partnership a lot so so we will uh, co-fund I think and co-develop ideas with with people with uh, the property sector we're just starting to get some work going with the National Trust as well to look at partnerships for um, you know how do you offer more to the National Trust 
um, uh, visitors and membership who live in cities uh, and what does that mean you know national trust is associated typically with with buildings and, and our heritage but we've got an amazing industrial heritage in manchester and i want to open up our, our river corridors as well as our, our green infrastructure and, and large park making systems uh, that's fantastic uh, louise I, I think it's uh it's it's quite an innovation for uh, the council to appoint somebody like you into such a, an important strategic role, and um, it's it's getting members like like you who who are who are landscape architect trained um, in those decision making positions because um, at the end of the day you're going to, you could have a, an enormous influence on what what happens uh, over the next uh, months and years, but I I, I was wanted to ask you uh, uh, because. So often green spaces are so uh, badly thought through and, and often poorly delivered. Um, do you think we need better legislation to ensure a higher quality and, and to sort of combat uh, climate change and to make sure biodiversity and, and sort of creating places for people? Do you think we need legislation to do that like they've done in, for example, in Singapore or even the London greening factor? You know, I think we should collectively work towards that. I think we have to be quite careful with legislation that we get the right tools. Um, but I think it's something again that the that the the built environment and the and the natural environment professions have a real opportunity to show leadership in. To be honest, in my role, it would help. <laughs> you know, the the more hooks I have because uh, I oversee our planning committee, I, I oversee our housing agenda, our development agenda. So if I'm able to to help shape legislation that, that gets those green outcomes. We talk a lot through our planning briefs about a landscape led approach to development. So if you if you take the Northern Gateway project, which I mentioned where the city river park will be, that will ultimately be 15,000 new homes. So, so that's actually the size of a, a small town to the north of the city. And, and we're being very upfront in terms of wanting the, the park and the open spaces and the ecological restoration to lead the way. And actually we know our development partners see the value that that will bring to their properties in in the longer term so there's lots of thinking um, that i've taken as well in a previous role i did a lot on garden towns and cities for government i led some of that work in government and there we were looking at what tools do you need to to really integrate nature and urbanity and, and that's what we're talking about it's, it's an ancient concept isn't it nature in the city you, you touched on it in your slides but you know, I'm I'm proud to be a member of this profession that really thinks about those things. And I agree with you. The, the more uh, landscape architects we can get into kind of city leadership positions, the better. So so that's something I want to focus on as well. But but we'll need the sort of collaborative support, I think, of of the membership to do that. And I also think the way we've been trained as well uh, has been enormously useful to me in this time. Not everyone can imagine a different future. You, you know, that's part of. I think how we're trained as landscape architects to, to think about a different future. And um, those are skills that I've used, even in our economic recovery planning, you know, to, to be able to think, well, how is the city changing? What's the future for high streets is not the same as the past. What, what kind of, you know, reuse of spaces can we do and achieve those, those green and zero carbon ambitions in the process? So, so I think I'm, I'm optimistic about the, uh, the talent that, that we have on the call today and across our sector. Uh, that's uh, Louise. You're, you're a real role model for for people who um, aspire to uh, seeing that change. And um, I'd like to thank you for for joining us this morning. Please stay with us. Um, if you just switch off your camera and microphone for a, a few minutes, and then you can rejoin after I've spoken to our next guest. No problem. Uh, thank you, Jen. See you in a few moments. So uh, I'm delighted to um, introduce our next guest this morning it's the the garden designer and gardeners world presenter dan pearson good morning dan are you there hello so dan trained in horticulture at rhs wisley uh, the royal botanical uh, botanic gardens in edinburgh jerusalem botanical gardens and the royal botanic gardens q he's a member of the society of garden designers and an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, the RIBA to you and me. He, uh, his garden at Chatsworth and the Laurent Perrier at the 2015 Chelsea Garden Show was awarded a gold medal and the best show garden. Dan is also a prolific writer and has written a number of books. So we're delighted to have you here this morning, Dan. How are you? 
I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting me. We're all getting much more used to communicating like this. Yes, um, yes. And it's been something I think that has really shown us that we are an adaptable uh, tribe of people. So we're able to work in landscape and the land, um, but we're also able to keep everything going through this media, it's great. It is. Uh, Dan, I saw your beautiful garden in Somerset on Gardener's World in September. How long did it take you to design and build it? Because it looked so mature. We moved here 10 years ago exactly, and I spent about five years uh, kind of planning what I was going to do, replanting hedges, letting the land, it's a 20 acre site, rewild a bit, um, over sowing pasture into meadows, so doing quite a lot of background work and thinking about what the garden was going to be. Um, and the garden was put in in 2016, so it was a lot of planning. And then once I knew what I was going to do, it all came together really quite quickly. And the ground here used to be a market garden so it faces south runs down to a stream there's water pouring through the land so it's uh, it's good land to garden on so we had a head start sounds fantastic um so uh, as you know this morning we're considering what uh, designing in a post-covid world might be like trying to imagine uh, the, the the new landscape um there's been a lot of discussion this year in light of uh, the pandemic about the role of the private gardener in our lives. Are you noticing any changing trends around garden design? I think we have been seeing over the last, certainly the last five years, many more people wanting to grow to eat, to know where their food comes from, to grow organically, to be part of a process, which is actually a very straightforward one of engaging with a kind of real time frame through growing your own food. So people are asking for fruit and veg um, and a part of the garden to certainly be productive. And that's a real commitment. It isn't something that feels remotely faddish to me. And this is happening on different scales. So, you know, we've been putting in small garden spaces into larger gardens and then planting orchards and larger productive places into into the bigger projects that we're working on. So it feels very embedded to me. And one of the things that I think really happened this year and crystallized it for me was this desire for people to get outside. Again, you mentioned it in your um, prelude uh, to, to the event today. And it really is something that people felt very passionate about was this connection with being outside again and being stuck inside through the lockdowns really allowed our public spaces in cities particularly to become uh, something which you didn't have to be interested in gardening or landscape to see the value in them all of a sudden they were places that people wanted to be so it's run right the way through i think you know even people who haven't got gardens are now pining for places um, in which they can feel that nature connection or certainly a connection to the environment. Yeah, and, and of course, with the new um, high density residential de uh, developments, there's been a tendency to move away from the private garden to sort of public spaces. In light of COVID, do you think this is a good idea? I think it's, um, I think it was very interesting what Louise was saying about us um, being able to kind of see ahead as landscape designers and landscape architects, you know, it's something that we do all the time and it feels like that, that's been coming for a while. This um, importance of green space uh, in terms of it being uh, embedded from the very beginning in terms of uh, planning that into, into new projects, into new housing. And I think that balance between um, the small private space, which can often be a balcony um, and a shared space, which could be a street that's just beautifully planted, that has pockets of spaces where people can be and meet each other, you know, at the end or the beginning of the day. I think that's, um, that's something that we're seeing more and more. We're working with um, a team of uh, property developers in Australia, actually, at the moment, who are looking at reversing the whole idea of your inside space being the thing that dominates they're looking because their climate's slightly different in terms of shrinking the inside space and making the balconies into um, something that's 
uh, a bigger space for people to be in. So they've got that outside connection and then linking that to small communal spaces um, that people can get into. So there's this very much kind of outside feeling coming in. And I think that we've really got used to the idea of being outside. And I think in Britain, certainly here, we're used to all weathers. Um, so I think it'll be something that we start to see as being a much more integrated way that we are prepared to live, um, sharing our outside spaces, you know, looking at places which you might not normally have thought to be or dwell in, um, those little tiny pocket parks that are developing through guerrilla gardening, those places are becoming much more valuable again, which is great. Yeah, I, um, but what you're saying is having your private space is is still important, but it's having it's having the choice, isn't it, of either or. Yeah, I think it's about it's about getting that balance. And you know, your private your private space doesn't have to be that big if you've got access to somewhere beyond it um, yeah. that's been considered properly. Yes. Um, there's been, um, I've, I've got a few questions here, I don't think we're going to have time to get through them all, but um, uh, there's been much in the news about the, uh, uh, about the demise of the, the High Street and the, the LI is a partner to the High Street Task Force and some of our members have been appointed as consultants. In, is your sector uh, engaged in greening of High Streets and do you have any examples where this has happened? Well, the Garden Museum at the moment have got a wonderful project on the go with Lambeth to try and create um, a new space outside the Garden Museum called Lambeth Green. Um, the Garden Museum has become this wonderful little hub of um, horticulturally connected people. And there's a space outside, which is just a, a council, um, little tiny little park, which has been currently gardened by the Garden Museum called St Mary's and their plan is to um, make a green there that then filters the tendrils out, uh, the, the green tendrils out into all the streets around so that it becomes this sort of green hub for somewhere which really is just a through place at the moment. Um, and I think if they can pull it off and it works, um, you can see how quickly the green spaces can be can be connected through the streets actually becoming almost like green arteries which um, make the parks uh, reach uh, out and come together through those arteries being connected. So we're seeing more enterprise on that front in terms of um, people who are uh, wanting to connect into those hard green spaces, hard urban spaces and make them green. And something like that, I think, has has real mileage. It'll it'll really start to work a lot more effectively, particularly now with uh, this new re-engagement with outside space being made so clear by COVID. I, I want to ask you one quick uh, question, and it could be a little bit controversial, I suppose, but there is such an emphasis on green infrastructure uh, at the moment for for our sector. <laughs> What is your experience of the planting skills of the recent graduates? Do you think education in, uh, of the landscape professional should major on planting design? I think planting design is a, is, is a subject in itself. Um, when I decided I wanted to um, not just garden with plants, because I, I, I studied horticulture, but put plants together to make environments, I could see then in the 80s that the it was a weakness in the courses um, and that I thought I thought okay well I'm going to learn about this first and then apply um, the landscape architecture to it. Um, so I sort of went the other way around and I can still see today although it's so much better than it was when I was studying in the 80s um, there's still a big gap because it's an enormous subject it's something that takes a long time to learn you simply can't learn about the life cycle of plants when um, you're just looking at them over one or two seasons. You need several to be able to understand it. So the people that are applying to our studio, for instance, for work, you know, it's always something, it's not something we depend upon as being um, something that they will know uh, enough about. We, we go into a training process once they come to the studio um, to make that 
something that is um, a, a much better knowledge. So it's still weak. Um, it's much better than it was. Um, the universities of Sheffield, for instance, they're making it a, a great strength. So there are places where it's certainly becoming um, well known as a place that you go to to make it into something that you've really got a good understanding of. But we're also looking at graduates now who are coming into landscape architecture from another discipline. So people often come with um, a transferable skill from before um, and a, a, an interest which might have grown over many years in, in gardening or, or uh, understanding plants better. So it's certainly better, but it could certainly be better. Yes, I, th I think if we all have a garden, we can all experiment and uh, learn a lot from that, can't we, as we see plants thriving and in some cases dying. So uh, I'd encourage everybody to have a go at planting, no matter how small their plot might be. Um, perhaps I could ask uh, Louise to rejoin us, if you could switch your mic and camera back on Louise. Oh, there you are. Good. I'm glad you haven't disappeared. Um, so we have a few questions now with, the, with both of you, have a bit of a discussion, uh, but before I start on some questions, there's a, there's a question that's come through from one of our viewers this morning, Dennis O'Keefe, I just want to say hello Dennis, I haven't seen you for a long time, I hope you're well, um, but Dennis, um, I worked with Dennis many years ago on a hospital and up in Dumfries and Galloway and he's asked a question how can we augment the current design quality indicators for landscape in an effective and flexible way? Um, Louise, I know it's a, I've just chucked this one at you and I do apologize. Do you have anything that um, we could offer Dennis, an answer we could offer Dennis on that one? Wow, that is, that's like a dissertation right there, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, we, have done quite a bit of work actually looking at, at quality standards and and if they are you know we've asked ourselves actually is the setting of standards is that how you get uh, a better quality product i think it's it's part of it but i think it's bigger than that actually and there's the point that that we touched on earlier get it getting uh, a movement towards that better legislation uh, so, and, and that comes from some of the things dan's just touched on the real appreciation i, I think more than anything 2020 has made us appreciate nature, <laughs> appreciate the value of, of green space. Um, uh, even if it's a, a tiny, you know, windowsill, if you've had to self-isolate and you live in a flat, you, you may well have had to stay inside, you know, so people have, have been growing stuff um, uh, uh, in a very confined environment in many cases. So I think there's a combination of standards, certainly, of legislation, but I think where, where I'm a bit more optimistic, there's also that kind of movement for change, which is where you see the environmental movement uh, actually now being at the heart of something like city making, which which is not where it would have previously been. So, so standards and legislation help, um, but more than anything, it's practice. And, and that's the space I think we should collectively move towards. Yeah, and I think also this summer, we've seen so many uh, surveys of the general population where they have placed a very a high regard for um, open their open green space in their local parks and they all want to see there's a very high percentage of people want to see more spending um, in those areas which is great because if we get the force of the public behind us that's um, half the problem and and it's always a difficult issue for us as in our profession is getting ourselves um, uh, taken more seriously and influencing government policy. Dan, do you have any suggestions how we could be taken more seriously as a sector? I think that what I'm seeing more of certainly is um, architects coming to us at the very beginning of a project, um, instead of us being uh, included um, later, you know, after the event, um, where we have to try and massage buildings into landscape. They're asking for us opinion, our opinion. Um, so I would say that if we could influence um, architecture, ar architects to include us earlier um, and planners to see the value of landscape and thorough thinking around placemaking being something that helps to integrate architecture and then 
um, a much more balanced meeting point between um, the people that are using space and the people that are um, occupying it in terms of where they live. I think we'll start to see um, a, a more kind of natural gravity towards landscape architecture. Yes, Louise, um, do you have any anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I am biased, but this is an amazing profession, <laughs> you know, and I, I actually my first uh, degree was as a surveyor, I trained and worked as a surveyor and was quite frustrated in my 20s that that it didn't feel creative, it didn't feel very joined up. I, I thought about architecture then and, and, you know, I'm in my early 50s now, so it's a little while ago, uh, and I went to um, America to, to get a degree at, at the Graduate School of Design at, at Harvard on a scholarship from, on a horticultural scholarship, um, it was the only way I could have got there, uh, and it was, I mention all that because at the time, 20 years ago, Harvard had um, more, many more architects in the School of Design than it had landscape architects because it was a, a dominant profession, if you like. In the 20 years since, so from sort of 2000 to, to now, uh, there are many more landscape architects in that school and it's quite a visionary school. The architects absolutely, as Dan said, now see the value of what we bring. We are the big picture thinkers. You know, we think, I think of, of Manchester as a, as a cityscape, you know, uh, we, we, you can think of England as a giant garden <laughs> with, with a load of development around our kind of urban or, or suburban areas. And so I think we've got the ability to think in that way. And, and that will be so important. I absolutely mean what I said around the, the skills of our profession being vital to, to how, you know, the, the post-pandemic world is gonna be challenging too. And, and, it, and there's less money to go around and people have dealt with um, enor enormous amounts of grief. So actually the way that landscape can heal, um, met, I think probably every family in the country has been affected uh, or knows somebody who has, has been lost or, or We've been very unwell through this time so so actually there's a there's enormous power in nature that, that we kind of know it's the secret that that we work with um and and the more we can do to share that with others we we will leave a far more important uh, legacy than the one we received yeah that, that's point very well made louise so um to to wrap up with um what are your pre predictions for next year dan um i think we're going to see many poor, more people wanting to find an allotment space or somewhere they can get their hands dirty and get outside. Um, we've seen the team members of our team who haven't got outside spaces are absolutely desperate for it. And I think just that simple move of getting your hands in the earth, I think, will start to open up a very real new chapter of connection again. Uh, it sounds very simple, uh, but it's, it's a very good starting place. We're also starting to see, um, we're working with a really interesting project called the Little Forest Oak. And it is a school for children under uh, five who are, their classroom is the forest. So they don't have any shelter other than bivouacs and their learning is the forest, their place, their medium is the mud and, and what grows there. And we're starting to see, um, you know, we were in, interested in working on that project because it's really from the bottom up. You know, those kids get the most incredible perspective on the world through um, simply being out in it. Um, and I, I see an enormous amount of hope in that. So. I think more of that will come and there'll be more of a commitment with parents wanting to have their kids connecting to nature from the beginning. Louise, what are your predictions for the future, for next year? Well, I had a bit of time to think about this one. Um, uh, similar to Dan, I've jotted down uh, more young gardeners, which is a great thing, um, partly because you know, their curriculum has changed as well. I've, I've got uh, young nephews and they've all been growing sunflowers and basil and the, the stuff you can do on a on a windowsill. And, you know, for many people that has been their access to nature. So so I think um, uh, the, that kind of growth of uh, long term, I'm optimistic because because all those youngsters now understand nature in a different way. Um, uh, I also definitely see the environmental movement growing stronger in Manchester. We have a, a net zero carbon ambition by 20, 
38, you know, nationally, we've got that by 2050, but, but that is feeling close now. You know, we're, we're into a relatively small number of years to get there. So I think in, in um, the, the green growth, the, the green industrial revolution, the stuff I spoke about at the beginning, that, that will become uh, visible and real as we head to, towards COP26 as well. That, that is, is uh, a big moment. Uh, and then I, I've been swatting up, as I said, on ecological urbanism, on the greening of cities, on, on the rise of the parklet, you know, know, all these things that we can do at, at different scales to really transform our, our urban landscapes. And, and Dan talked about the, the green corridors, even in a, in a city as, as sort of dense and, and urban as London, you know, the, the joy is when you get that contrast, I think, of vanity and nature. And I see that as a, a, a definite area for growth and development. Thanks, Louise. Look, both of you, thank you so much for joining, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules this morning to, to join us for what's been a, a fascinating debate and discussion uh, about this year and future years. Um, you've given us uh, a lot of th food for thought. And I think if we get all those young gardeners gardening, we'll have a great supply of landscape professionals for the future. So, uh, and, and garden designers for the future too. So. Thank you both very much. And I'd like to wish you both a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. That's the first time I've said that with meaning. Absolutely. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you both. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Dan. Happy Christmas to all of you and a very happy 2021. It, it will get better. The light is there at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye, -bye. Bye, Louise. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So now we move on to our competition. Uh, we, uh, which I'm sure you all have been uh, looking forward to. Uh, many of you have tuned in this morning to find out um, who the winners are. So um, the competition held by the Landscape Institute, uh, Transforming the Urban Landscape, has looked at how our urban spaces would need to be adapted to incorporate the measures needed to restrict the spread of covid and other airborne diseases. It also looked at how the design of our urban spaces could mitigate the effects of climate change. The competition was open to international entry so we could learn from good practice around the world and it's been held entirely online and this is include, including the judging process which was held over Zoom and I can tell you that it was quite a job. Um, I'd like to thank our five sponsor companies whose su uh, support made the competition possible and we'll have a chance uh, later to ask them what the competition means to them. Uh, there were 12 judges who represented different aspects of the profession and I'd like to thank them all because it was a mammoth task. By the deadline we'd received over 160 entries, 100 student entries and 60 professional submissions which was quite a daunting challenge for the judges when we met last week and the quality of entries was exceptionally high there was very little difference in standard between the professional and the student categories and you can view the entries online so i'd urge you to head to the online exhibition on the competition website and take a look so this morning we're lucky to have two of our judges join us we have dr nelson ogan shakin and dr cristalia Kambasanu. So if you could both turn on your cameras and microphones. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Jane. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, it's, it's great to see you both again after, after our mammoth session. Um, I'd just like to ask you a, a couple of questions before we actually uh, start looking at who, uh, who the winners are. So, um, Cristalia, perhaps I could ask you first, what impressed you about the entries and do you think they address the issues of a post-COVID environment? Thank you. Um, I have to say that the first thing that impressed me, uh, I was in the student category and what impressed me was the sheer volume of entries. Uh, I mean, I'm a lecturer, so I'm used to assessing um, coursework, student coursework in large volumes, but this was probably the largest I've ever had to do in one sitting. Uh, I think the, the sheer fact that they came from all over the world um, showed that the topic of the competition struck a chord with students uh, 
and uh, we had entries from, apart from the UK and the US, we had entries from uh, China, which had by far the, the largest share of entries, I think, the Arab world, but also Malaysia, Philippines, um, uh, Israel, Turkey, Greece, Hungary, Colombia, um, and just to name, to, to name just a few. And so I think there was a lot of cultural variation there, which was very interesting to see. And I think that what is really important is that the students uh, as aspiring new designers really thought hard about possibly all the temporary transformations that um, my colleagues before me, the speakers have mentioned and what we've all been experiencing during COVID, how streets have turned into pedestrian or uh, cycling routes or how parks have managed to, to become a lifeline during the lockdown, you know, to alleviate stress and anxiety relating to, to the pandemic, take pe people out of confinement, but also, uh, you know, provide a space for people uh, outside of this online everything. And, and so they managed to take, uh, to, to, to use that temporary transformation of the urban landscape basis and turn it into envisioning and reimagining and experimenting for, for things that could actually stick into the future of our cities um, for fairer, healthier, and uh, more sustainable cities. Uh, and I think it's, it was very interesting to see how we move from temporary transformations into permanent change through the student entries. Sorry, Jane, you're on mute. <laughs> Typical. Thanks, thanks, Cristalia. The, the, uh, it was a really interesting process, uh, and I, I like the way you pointed out the differences between the cultures. It was a very significant difference between the entries from different parts of the world, and see how they tackled not only the 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 the, the, the idea of the, the design, but also in their method of designing. I thought it was fascinating. Um, Nelson, um, what are your thoughts, uh, and what impressed you? Um, about the entries. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, award. Um, obviously, this is my first time in being active within the Landscape Institute, so I'm delighted to be invited. Um, from the standpoint that, you know, I deal with major projects around the world. Um, I was in the professional side of it rather than the student side of it. And as you correctly stated in your opening statement, uh, we had over 60 entrants in there there were a lot of high caliber entrants, uh, just like my previous uh, speaker said, they were wide ranging, different geographical coverage, different cultural you know, area, which really impresses me. And I think with the COVID-19, a lot of people really thought about, you know, uh, the design that is required in the new world as we move from what we used to call the norm into the new normal. And I find it very interesting the way individual submission came across they really, really took the subject at heart uh, and they built you know, sustainability into the whole process and the whole idea of people now getting out. And as you probably know, Jane, with the situation of everybody moving out of big city and now moving back into a urban area, there's the issue about how do you use the open space you know, for community gathering, for community getting together. And I find that very, very interesting. It was a good combination of a submission. It was challenging. Uh, for us who had the judging panel, uh, but we did dive through the whole process, as you said, uh, to find the best of the best. But I have to be honest, I think most of the submissions were very, very good. I was very impressed. It was difficult to pick the right choice. Uh, in fact, you know, in the post session, when we came back and reviewed the submission, even trying to come to the conclusion among the judging panel was challenging. But all in all, I think it was a good combination of submission and I enjoyed the whole exercise tremendously. Oh, um, but uh, what I'd like to just say is, is to thank you both for uh, for helping with the judging. As I said, it was a, a, a mammoth task for everybody and also for joining us this morning. If you'd like to stay with us now, but just switch your camera and microphone off and then you can rejoin us for the announcement of the winners uh, whilst I um, welcome our competition sponsors and have a bit of a discussion with them. So I'll speak to you later. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to welcome our competition sponsors. Uh, from Vestry, we have Remy Rawlings, Ground Control, Warren Heaton, Selux, uh, we have Norman Emery, 
uh, Hards the Hardscape, Matthew Haslam, and last but not least, from Green Blue Urban, Howard Gray. Are you all here? Come on, Howard, switch on. Oh, you must have gone for a cup of coffee. Must have. Good morning, Jane. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome Good to morning. our webinar, the last of 2020. This has been a really successful competition. Uh, the quality of entries has been really high. The number of entries has been phenomenal. Um, I'm going to ask each of you if you could tell me what impressed you about the entries and what were the highlights particularly for you. And of course, that will be influenced um, by the sectors that you're in. So starting with, uh, with you, Romy, what, what caught your eye? Um, I think, as you say, the, the sheer volume of entries and, um, and the average quality and content of them, um, it actually was really hard to go through in the time we had allotted because some of them had so much detail in, in two A3 boards. It's incredible what can be actually achieved. Um, and some of the quality of a lot of information, which actually we'll see in, in the winning entries particularly, the, the quality of information refined down to make it legible and combined with the graphics, uh, particularly the winning ones, I think was, was really nice to see. It was so clear, so easy to see what could be done. Um, and I think as the title of the comp competition, some of the entries were truly transformational, um, you know, with before and after images, which just showed what we could be doing. So it, it was really great to be involved and uh, see the level of talent here and internationally. So I think we're in good hands if people are allowed to just get on and do what they have in their heads. What they do best, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Romy. Um, morning, Warren. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, as others have said, the, the volume of entries was, was very impressive. Um, the, the, the major highlight for me was the use of um, existing structures and where people had taken um, be it bridges or car parks and they've used those spaces and the, the existing infrastructure to then um, how they could transform those to support life and bring greenery into the cities. That was, um, yeah, that was a particular highlight for me. And morning, Norman. Morning, Jane. Hi, thank you. I like your bit of tinsel behind you. Oh, very good. Getting into the Christmas like spirit. Made an effort for us this morning. <laughs> Absolutely. <Thank you. laughs> I'm competing with what your background is about. I've got my parties <laughs> out today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I can only reiterate what uh, Warren and Romy have said because the quality of entries and the time that we had, you know, the volume. Um, what did we have? 160. We did 100. Uh, in the professional category and the entries were just amazing you know the detail that was shown uh, is quite incredible so I think you know the Landscape Institute uh, really has an enormous amount of talent and hopefully everyone starts jumping onto the band bandwagon because we have to bring nature back into our cities that is for sure yeah no, th thank you for that uh, morning Matthew Good morning, Jane. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm really good. You've had a busy morning. I have. Yeah. Well, it's going to get even busier as we go I through know. all of this. There's a lot to get through. So uh, what impressed you, Matt? You uh, you had a lot to go through in your sect section, didn't you? Yeah, there was a lot going on, which was really encouraging, but it was a bit like delivery of the vaccine, wasn't it? We did it in six months. Um, I remember a conversation that we all had with the LI, everybody on this screen here, uh, about how we can assist. And I think we realised, didn't we, in April that things were changing and we needed to explore what other people were viewing those changes should be. And I think all the entrants uh, demonstrated that really, really well. One thing that really struck me, though, was that collaboration and inclusivity of ideas is imperative. And I would say 80% of the entries I saw were teams of people coming together from different disciplines to produce their entries. And that's really good because the information that we're seeing from that and the assistance that we're all able to provide 
is being sanctioned by more than one skill. So it's it was really impressive. And uh, everybody is going on about how long it took to go through all the awards, but I really enjoyed it, albeit it was, there was a lot to get through. It was really good. It was exciting. Also, it was a, a fantastic standard. And um, good morning, Howard. Hello, Jane. How are you? I'm very well. I'm loving the leafy backdrop to your uh, to, to your screen yeah. this morning. Yes, well, it's um, things that I'm rather passionate about, trees and water. And I'd like to say that the the um, particularly I was so enthused about looking at the students work, the next generation of young people coming up with having a real passion about changing spaces that they're familiar with. All of them having chosen um, an area they felt that they could do something about. Um, and I think that we can see a green future that's going to be healthier and better and, and it's going to improve lives dramatically. So we are really, really thrilled to be involved and it was a great competition. I'd like to thank the ELI for hosting it. Now, Howard um, and all of you, uh, thank you all once again for sponsoring the, the competition. It wouldn't have happened without you and we really appreciate your support. And of course, you were all publicizing it as well. So we're very thankful for that. Um, I think it's been a fantastic showcase for our sector and uh, there's been some uh, really imaginative work uh, submitted. So it's looking, it's looking good for the future. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite back Nelson and Cristalia to switch on their... And we're now going to go through quite a complicated few moments and I just hope it's going to work as we move on to the all important part of this webinar, the big reveal. We're going to announce our winners. So hopefully most of our winners will be here. They don't know who they are. So it's going to be a big surprise for them as we switch on their microphones and cameras. So I hope you're all appropriately dressed. Uh, otherwise, it could be very embarrassing. Um, and um, if, if your name is called out, can you please uh, just uh, raise your hand in the particip participants box? And one of the LI team will be switching on your camera and microphone. So bear with us. I'm hoping this is going to, to work. Um, before the, the main winners are announced, uh, we have the pleasure of the sponsors who are going to be awarding their accolades. This is where the sponsors can choose the entry that resonates most with them. So, uh, starting with Romy. Romy, would you like to hopefully, oh, here we go, screen share. We've got, yeah, we've got the screen share going so we can see who the winners may be. Romy, over to you. Yep, I, I've got a black screen at the moment, but um, thankfully I can remember who we wanted to award our accolade to. And it's, I'm going to read so I get this right. It's PWP Design Limited with Arvint Engineering Limited for my third place. We were looking for, that. there you go, now you can see. Um, we were looking for somewhere that was going to create a truly caring and social meeting place and this just stood out uh, for me. It brought together everything in terms of sustainability, the economic, the environmental, but very, very much the social. And do have a look at it. It's basically transforming unloved and unused um, garages and sort of back of house areas, which we have in every single town and city, into somewhere that really becomes a community hub and pulls people in. Um, so we absolutely loved it. Congratulations to both teams. We look forward to uh, sending you a hamper of Nordic goodies um, in the near future. Thanks, Romy, and uh, congratulations, the PWP team. So uh, next is Ground Control's um, accolade. Warren, would you like to announce which entry gets your accolade? Yeah, indeed. <clears throat> it was a, a great but um, simple idea to convert the uh, top story of uh, multi-story car parks into green spaces uh, in the middle of our cities. Um, such important space and 
to create um, al almost a, a destination area, but uh, it's the brilliant use of space and how it utilized the existing infrastructure. Um, and it, it's just a great example of turning the, the gray to green. Um, and that was uh, Urban Green's uh, submission of no car parks. Congratulations, Urban Green. Oh, that's a beautiful uh, render there. Thanks, Andrew. I see you keeping up with us with the slideshow. Thanks for that. Um, now, Norman, perhaps you could announce Selux's accolade. Thank you, Jill. Um, Jane, I beg your pardon. Um, a Tree for Me by Will Binley. Um, so although Will's entry did not meet the competition briefing, uh, we felt that its powerful message, uh, and it's a far-reaching message, encapsulates much of the spirit of this event. Uh, environmental changes can be seen overwhelming by solutions to the crisis. Uh, and a simple thing is a tree for me if communities, industry, governments act together to bring nature back to our streets. And it was mentioned earlier that Manchester is putting, is will be planting, I hope I'm correct in this figure, but 20 million trees into their, into their project, which is phenomenal. And I think that way, we as a company, Sealux, believe that bringing nature back into our cities is the right way forward to us. So well done, Will. And uh, we have decided that because Will is a supporter of uh, a major football club, Manchester City, that we'd like to get in touch with him. Um, <laughs> um, and we'll offer him a little uh, a prize from, from that point of view. So thank you very much again, Jane. Thank you. And well done, Will. Thank you. Thanks, Norman, and congratulations, Will. Uh, I think that's a, a magnificent entry. Um, Matthew, your turn to announce Hardscape's choice for an accolade. Well, we've got two choices, actually, because we do believe in Plan A and Plan B at Hardscape. Uh, but I do think that everybody was a winner, really, because the work that gone into the bids at whatever level, uh, student or professional, was exemplary. Um, I really liked, uh, and I did, uh, ask my colleagues their views as well. Uh, ozone by, uh, and hopefully I've got the right pronunciation, Elizabeth Diakantonis. Um, the, the, the overriding thing about this scheme was the graphic and the layout. It just kept bringing us back to look at it. But it was the um, division of space into making health and well-being at the forefront, which was one of the reasons for this competition, and mixing non-fuel transport modes, as you can see there, we really thought that was great. Um, and the second one, uh, coming to the uh, park drive that we are all talking about, was the creating a better social and ecological future in Glasgow by Kit Bowen, and a team at TGP Landscape Architects. Uh, City Park graphics were great, really explained the things that we needed to do and what we've all been banging on about since March. So two schemes, really good. And we are gonna be um, providing an innovative tablet desk award, which you will receive shortly. Uh, so congratulations, well done both teams. Thanks, Matthew. And congratulations, Elizabeth Kitt and TGP. And finally, Howard, who's going to receive the Blue Green Urban Accolade? Thank you, Jane. Uh, well, Green, Green Blue Urban are absolutely thrilled to give the accolade to the project called Nature Works, um, which is by Shahaf Zakeh a student in Israel, and is really talking about um, bringing up our interconnecting areas within Tel Aviv to actually make them workable areas, but actually livable areas too. So that there's um, a great um, crossing or, or, or meshing of the green infrastructure availability um, to everybody and bringing in water as well. The use of water within our cities um, done very, very intelligently. Obviously, a lot of got thought gone into it. So we were 
really pleased to um, give the accolade to uh, Shaf and be sending him a £50 Amazon voucher. Thank you very much, Howard, and congratulations, Shahaf. That's a, a that's a, a wonderful project, and I hope you uh, enjoy your your prize from Blue Urban, Blue Green Urban. So now we get to the juicy part of the uh, of the awards. The winners. It's been such a high standard and extremely diff difficult to choose a winner, but we had to whittle it down. So first. We're going to go to the student category. The runners up in this category are Nature Works, redefining urban workspaces as a framework for well-being in everyday life by Shahif Sake, the student at Israel Institute of Technology. Congratulations, Shahif. And the other runner up. Warm Youth by the student team at Beijing Forestry University. Congratulations to both of you. Now moving on to the winner of the student category. The winner is Link Area Flowing Connection After the Pandemic by uh, Xiaohu Lu, student at the University of Sheffield. The judges felt this entry addressed the brief concisely and conveyed a readily understood message. One judge commented, I really like this entry. It addresses the design of green space in a city post pandemic. It's a comprehensive and a beautiful design centered on a rain garden. It addresses the importance of nature in the city with habitat creation, issues of pollution and climate change with practical design solutions educating people about nature and this is an oasis for people who live in a high density area. So congratulations uh, Xiaohu. Um, if you're here please put your hands up. I don't think he's going to he or she's going to be here. Okay right in that case we'll now move on to the winners of the professional category. And the runners up are Canal Park Erwash, A Park for Vitality by Joe Bosley, Senior Landscape Architect at FIRA. Congratulations, Joe. I had nothing to do with this, I hasten to add. <laughs> <laughs> and the other runner up, my Third Place by Simon Hall, Director and Landscape Architect at PWP Design Limited in collaboration with Arvind Engineering Limited. Very good. Really good. Well Thanks. done. Well done, both of you. And finally, the winner of the professional category. I haven't got any drums to roll, but imagine them. The winner is Back Down to Earth, a joint collaboration between landscape architect and graphic designer and artists Hilary Barber and Adam Greatrix, the associate partner for Gillespie's stu lead studio. The judges thought that Back Down to Earth was a comprehensive approach with beautifully presented ideas on what we need for a real post-COVID green recovery in our urban landscapes brought together to prove it's all possible in one street. It's a beautiful piece of work. The illustrations are fantastic and it's so comprehensive. So congratulations, Hilary and Adam. That's a fantastic result and a very worthy winner. And we applaud you. And we applaud all our winners. So thank you all uh, for entering, for taking the time to enter. There's been so much effort put into the competition entries. It's really quite impressive. Um, just before we end the webinar, um, I think uh, and Andy's going to share his screen again. So I'm giving him a bit of a prompt. So we can uh, just review what's coming up in the 
next few months. So we've got a, uh, a busy start. Well, we've got a busy end to this year before we start next year again. So this Thursday, we've got the screening of the David Attenborough A Life on Our Planet. Um, on Tuesday, the 19th of January, we have the Placemaking Pioneers collaborating with uh, public realm artists. Next slide, please, Andrew. On the 27th to the 29th of January, we've got a fantastic uh, CPD event. We have the health, well-being and place and how, on how landscape delivers uh, positive change. So I should be looking forward to that event. Next one, please, Andrew. And um, to, just to mention the Firestarter uh, Academy, the Practical Business planning training course and building your pathway to a better business growth in 2021. Firestarter uh, have um, collaborated with the airline to provide um, uh, courses and um, you can start planning uh, your businesses. Uh, there are dates available in January. So uh, if you go to the um, web address that's on that slide you can find out more about it and I think we have another slide yes and at the end of March the 22nd to the 26th of March we have uh, half day events uh, on the Greener Recovery Festival and this is building on the uh, the Greener Recovery uh, document that we launched in September and it's giving um, the membership, the tools and the information they need to um, uh, deal with climate change, mitigation, biodiversity. Um, we'll be looking at technical guidance, training. So there's a lot there for everybody. So um, thank you very much for those. I think that is the last slide. Yes, it is. And to finish with, I'd like you all to put your hats on, switch your microphones on. And that brings an end to our webinar. Congratulations to all our winners. And thank you to our comp competition judges and of course our sponsors. Thank you all so much for your time during the, uh, during the competition, but also for your time today. I'd like to thank our guests, Louise Wyman and uh, Dan Pearson for joining us this morning. It was a fascinating insight into what they think is going to, um, what's going to be in store for us next year. And finally, thank you all for, for listening. We really appreciate you joining us this morning. And at the end of this most extraordinary year, I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a happy and healthy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice hat. Bye. Nice hat. Bye, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs>